Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kapke, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about Delta Lake, the heart of Data Lake House. But before I jump in, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where you get to join my inner circle, direct access to me, specialized content, and more. Let's jump in. This is an all code presentation, so get excited because I'm not going to do all that usual conceptual kind of stuff. I want to show you what is really going on when we talk about Data Lake House. And at the heart of it is what I mentioned, Delta Lake. Delta Lake is what creates the simulation, if you will, of a relational database on top of Apache Spark, or more specifically, on top of a data lake. Before we can actually get into demos, you're going to need some data. Now, the code and the data is available. Just follow a link in the description of this video, which will take you to GitHub, where you can download both. And let's get in now. We're going to upload the files. So we go in here, and you can see I've got some stuff in here. But I'm going to go in, and I'm going to click on Create Table. But I'm not actually going to create a table. I'm going to use this Upload File section to find my files. And you can see I've got two files here. I can do both together like this. Just click both and say Go. And there you got it. you got two files. I'm not going to go through the other steps, which allow me to create tables for these. We're going to do that in our code. But this is a nice, quick, and easy way to get the data where you need it. So now we're back in our notebook, which is going to walk us through what's so cool and exciting about the Data Lake House, which is really, again, Delta Lake. Now I got a nice little link here you can find in the notebook, which will take you to a description of what is Data Lake House. But I want to step back for a minute in my Wayback Machine and give you a little perspective. At a point a few years ago, Databricks realized we have a problem. And that problem is that we can't just insert, update, and delete. In other words, we can't maintain data the way a relational database is. And this is a problem because what are we trying to do really with a data lake? We're trying to replace a data warehouse. Problem is, data warehouses are generally built on relational databases, which have excellent data maintainability support. I mean, they're great. Insert, delete, change, not a problem. But the data lake didn't work so well with that. Now, I think what happened is they looked around and said, what's the best way we can implement this kind of support without throwing everything out that we already built? Well, a very popular file format on Spark has been for a while now called Parquet. And Parquet is great. It's column store and it's compressed and it's really good for storing data. However, Parquet format does not allow you to do inserts, updates, or deletes. It will let you append. And that's really because a Parquet file is not a specific file. It's a folder. And any Parquet partition files that sit underneath it, which we'll see in a minute, just get collected and it shows it to you as if it's one big file. So what I'm going to try to explain to you is when Databricks decided to put in this support for a relational database simulation, I'll call it, they decided that the foundation of it would be Parquet files, but they were going to augment Parquet files to give it extra functionality. We'll see how they did in a minute, but I'll give you a little spoiler alert. It comes down to this thing called log files. Very important. So it's going to be the logs that are the key. So when you get this enhanced support, you don't call it a Parquet file anymore. You call it a Delta file. So that's the big difference, but it's really Parquet under the covers. Now, I want to make my notebook omnipotent. Honestly, I never really heard that word until Databricks started using it, but omnipotent just means rerunnable, essentially. It'll do the same thing over and over, no matter what I do, no matter how many times I run it. So I'm going to run this first, which is dropping tables if they exist. That way, I can walk through this, and I can run it again and again. So what we want to do is make sure our files are there before we start all the other work. So we'll just do a quick listing if you're not used to this this uh, percent fs means file system commands and then we can do basically linux type commands here i'm doing a directory listing with ls and i see that i have a dim sales territory that's going to be our master table and i have another file which is dim sales territory transactions the idea i want to get to here is i want to show how you can apply transactions to a table using delta lake Working in Python, so we're going to create a Spark data frame, SPDF underscore sales territory, T-E-R-R. -R. My naming convention is S for Spark, P for Python, and D for data frame, just so I know what type of data frame I'm dealing with as I read my code. I'm going to do Spark read, format is CSV, option header is equal true, meaning that will take the first row to use as my column names. Option is in first schema true, meaning let Databricks figure out what the data type should be based on the data in the file. And finally, the load method is pointing to where the file is, and it's going to load that file into a Spark data frame. Okay, looks good. And we can do a little, if you open this up, you can see the uh, schema of your data frame. 
want to look at the data frame, we can just do a display on it. We can see it's really small, which is why it's great for this demo. Only 11 rows, looks good. And it's really very simple. It's a sales territory kind of lookup table, gives you the region, the country, and the sales territory group. Now we have our Spark data frame. What we can do to make it into a delta table, which is really just a fully relational table as far as we're concerned, is we can persist it using the write method. I'm going to use override so that the table's already there, it will replace it. Format is delta because we could be saving it in some other format, but it's delta. And it's got to be delta because we're going to save it as a table. We want it to be queryable as a table and insertable and all those good things. So let me save this as a table. Now the fun begins because we have an actual relational table. At least it looks like that. Here I'm using the percent SQL magic. I'm just going to say describe dim sales territory. Wow, pretty cool. Now in a relational database, typically you have what's called the database catalog, which is a bunch of tables which store column definitions and table definitions and things. And it's supposed to be under the information schema. You can query those tables and all this type of stuff. On Spark, we can do the same thing, but we use describe. And we can ask for information about our tables. And here we get a nice listing of what's in it and the data type. But a nice feature is when you use describe extended because it gives you more information. And this is really great because we can see a lot more that we're missing. For instance, we know it is in the Spark catalog. We know it's in the default database, right? We can see the table name. And this is really important. It's a managed table. What does that mean? Well, there's two types of tables when it comes to Delta, and it is managed or unmanaged. And what it means if it's a managed table is if you do a SQL drop, you will also delete the data that goes with it. So you have to be careful with that. What do I mean by that? I mean that when we say this, it actually created a Delta file, but then it cataloged the description of that file in Hive. I'll show more of that in a minute, but we can even see here that it stored the Delta table under Hive. So it's in the Hive Metastore. We can see that Delta is the provider, meaning that's the data type. Finally, we can see table properties. Well, if this is really a table, I should just be able to do select statements against it. No questions asked. And look, I can. The important thing to understand is, how did it know where to find the table? In the prior statement in here, it just knows. It knows because the Hive Metastore is a place that Databricks is going to look automatically to say, can I find this, especially when you're referring to a table. So whenever you're going to be referring to a table, you say this, that, or whatever, and you're asking for a table name, it goes and looks it up in the Hive Metastore. That is your catalog. Again, in a relational database, that would be the SQL catalog or whatever, the tables that define it. So it knows how to find things just like a relational database would. And we can do any kind of query we want. I'm just doing a very simple order by, but you could do any kind of query you want. Well, Brian, is there a file with this? You said something about Hive and a file, and I don't know what you meant. Well, let me explain. I'm going to do a listing here to see the physical file that is underpinning the table. And we got this from that describe extended. It told us where it is, and it's here. When we look at this, there's a few things we can take away. One, we know that this Hive location is the default. So when you look at DBF, use Hive, warehouse, that's the default when we create tables if we don't tell it otherwise. Here's our table name. And then we got this strange thing. We have a folder which is called Delta Log. The thing about the Delta Log folder is that's how you know this is a Delta file and not a Parquet file. In fact, that's pretty much the only indication you'll have because if you look at the file itself here, you can see that aside from a really overly long name, it says Parquet, snappy Parquet. So we know it is a Parquet file, but it's got a log going with it. Now we're not going to look right now at that log, but we're going to go into great detail in a future video about that log and what it's actually doing. Since we did something, we created a table, you'd think, hmm, is there some sort of tracking in what I'm doing to that table, including the original create? Yes, yes, there is. You can see when we do describe history, it shows us our original create statement. So we can see this whole thing. It shows us the create and what it did. We can scroll over and see, shows us here that it created the table. And what this is doing is reaching into the Delta log and pulling out what's been happening to this table. That's why you have that extra folder. The Delta logs folder is where it's storing all the activity of what you do to this table. Well, I'm not going to stop right there. What my real goal here is to show you just how cool this is. I can do inserts, deletes, updates, and everything to my table just like I would on a relational database. So let's start by pulling in the file which holds our transactions, DIM sales territory transactions. I'm going to put that into SPDF underscore sales ter underscore trans. So we know that's the transaction file. And just like before, we're going to get a Spark data frame. 
and just take a look at it for a minute so we can review what is our transactions going to do here. Well, we've got two first rows, right? And one has one and two. We have got sales territory keys one and two. So what we're going to be doing with these transactions is we're going to update something. And what we're really interested in updating is the sales territory group. Because guess what? AdventureWorks, the owner of this data, they just joined the Federation. That's right. Captain Kirk came and everything. So we're going to update one of these sales territories to belong to the Federation. And we're going to update another one to belong to the Klingon Empire, because apparently they broke away. We're also going to insert this row. And it's going to be easy to see because the territory key is 99. Should be easy to see. This one's being added from the Klingon Empire. It's in the country, actually the planet of Kronos, and it's in Kalos. That's the home territory region. And finally, we're going to delete the last one. Number three is the really the third in the sorted order we just looked at. We're going to delete it all together. So we're going to get inserts, updates, and deletes, which is really the only things you can do to data. So you're going to get to see it all at once. Aren't you excited? I know I am. So what we're going to do now is take our transaction data frame and do what we did before. Write, mode, overwrite, delta, save as table, blah, blah, blah. We'll run that. Now, you don't really have to save the transactions to a table, but I like doing that because then I can use all SQL syntax to do my update. And I can use a really cool statement called merge. That's why I wanted to do it that way, because I like SQL and I'm lazy. And that's the easiest way, I think, to do this. Let's take a look again, make sure we can see our table. And we see that the data frame is now persisted to a SQL table or a Delta table. Now, this is to me where the magic really happens and the most powerful part of Delta Lake. We can use a merge. A merge, some people call it upsert, some people call it other things. SQL Server has a really good merge statement. It's relatively new, actually. It's only a few years, really, they've had it. Because what a merge does is we can do the insert, update, and delete all in one statement. So it's kind of like an all in one ETL. And fortunately, the Databricks merge statement is almost identical to the one that SQL Server uses. So I found this particularly easy to get used to. So let's walk through how the merge works. You start with merge into, and remember, this is a SQL statement, merge into our target table. In other words, the master table we're going to update, dim sales territory. And I'm going to use an alias, T-E-R-R. -R. We're going to be updating it from or using dim sales territory underscore transactions, which we will alias trans. We need to provide a join. So this is our join. So this is how it knows how to align the data. You need to be using the primary key so it knows what it's matching on. So we're using the primary key of the delta table here, trans. We're going to match that to the master table. And they both have sales territory key. Now, the order of this matching is important because as soon as it gets a hit, it jumps out. So you want to make sure you apply the most specific filter criteria before the more general. So for by delete, I'm going to say when matched on the key, when matched, and the transaction side of sales territory region is equal to delete. I don't know if you remembered, but it actually is just dummied out as delete because we're just deleting it. Then we're going to delete the row. Otherwise, in other words, if this part did not match, then we're going to do an update and we are setting the sales territory group in the master to the one that's in the transaction file. If there is no match, then it's just going to insert the row. Now let's take a look at the table to see if our changes took effect. We can see in the first row, we did get the Federation. We can see in the second row, the Klingon Empire now owns that particular sales territory. We can also see that the 99 got inserted. And finally, you see between two and four, there's no three. That means that was successfully deleted. So, wow, it worked. So that's pretty cool. We got that done. And that's really important because at the heart of this is the ability to do that. Change, update, delete. This is going to happen very often, typically, in a data warehouse. It might be doing streaming where it's doing this very actively, or it could be some sort of a batch window, like nightly or weekly. Whatever it is, you're going to have that happen fairly often. Now, Brian, you just did this update. Did it track that in the log? Well, let's take a look by using describe history. And you can see here, Version zero, the first one is when we created it, and this is version one. And if we go along, we can see that it shows, yep, it, it did what we asked for. It's done the update. It's done all this cool stuff. I'm going to talk again at length about what the log is, how it works, and how to read it. But the bottom line of this is it tracked what we did. So not only were we able to apply an update in a really intuitive way, just like on the relational data warehouses using a merge, 
but we're also getting a tracking and logging of the history of what we did. That's really crucial. So we're getting a nice package for how all this goes together. Now I have to do one takeaway in case you missed this because it's not always promoted heavily, but unlike a relational database like SQL Server, where you can wrap a transaction to do multiple table updates and actions, you can only do one table at a time in Delta Lake transactions. Let me say that again. In other words, imagine I need to apply a transaction and I wanna say insert a sales row, but I first have to have the customer. So I might put that in a transaction where I insert first the customer, then I insert the sale, and I want to keep this under like what they call acid, right? You want to make sure they both go together or they both fail. Well, in the delta tables, it can't do that. It can do one or the other. It can do both tables separately, but you can't tie the two transactions together. It does not allow that. It works on a table level. So this example I just pulled down from the internet online is an example, two different tables being wrapped in a single transaction. Can't do that. I thought a lot about that too, and I'm wondering like, is that really critical? And I don't think it's really as critical as it might sound at first, and I'll tell you why. There are two types of workloads, typically on a relational database, as an example. And they are, as I mentioned in our first video on this, is online transactional processing. That's your application heavy duty slamming away. And when you're doing that type of workload, you're typically coming in with a set of data that goes together. Like imagine I go in and I create an account and I deposit a balance in it. You can imagine a transaction in that case that says, you know, create a customer, create an account, and insert a balance into the account, all that stuff. So it wants to wrap all this data into a single transaction. For that kind of application, transactional processing, this kind of multi-table updates is pretty critical. And I'd say you'd be hard pressed to deal without it. However, we're not really talking about that kind of application. We're talking about a data warehouse. Data warehouses are different. In my experience, I tried to re think of a case where a data warehouse was actually trying to do multiple table transactions at the same time. And honestly, I can't think of many. And the reason is because you're doing a mass update typically. You're replacing the entire table or you're doing a mass update insert kind of thing where it's maybe hundreds of thousands of transactions you're applying. And it isn't going to be really effective to try to do that, splitting it up with the customer and sales and this. So what you typically do in a data warehouse is you rely on the system of record. That's the application. You rely on it to have it right. And I know that's a little weak to say, but you tend to do that. So if you're getting a good source of data, then you're kind of counting on it not to give you one thing without the other. It can happen, but even if this supported the idea of multi-table updates at the same time, I think the overhead of trying to use it would probably outweigh the benefits. And uh, I'm not trying to overly defend like, why they don't have this. There's a lot of reasons architecturally why it would be extremely difficult, I think, to apply multi-table transactions on a scaled out process like Spark. But I question if it's really critical. I would say, however, making that caveat, you should think in, how are you gonna validate the data later? So maybe you wanna bring it in, and before you actually try to apply the transactions, do some comparisons or whatever, and make sure that everything you need is there so you don't end up with a half-baked situation. So wrapping up, a few takeaways. Delta tables, let us get functionality much like relational tables, yay us. When we use the Spark data frame method, save as table, we get a managed table. Do you remember what those are? Managed tables are controlled by the Hive Metastore, meaning if you delete the table, drop table, the physical file under it will go away too. So be careful with that. Especially, you know, you typically would have this decoupled, right? You'd have the schema definition where you can query it, but the data itself is probably sitting in like Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, and you're probably not going to want to delete that, at least not lightly. So be careful with that. In some cases, you may want to actually create the file first and then just create a schema on top of it or catalog it afterwards, because then it's an unmanaged table and that can be a little safer if you want to manage it that way. We can use the SQL statement describe to describe the table. In other words, show us the columns and data types. We can use describe history to see the transactions that have been applied to a table. And as I mentioned, delta table transactions can only be made against a single table. So that's it for this time. Please like, share, subscribe, and uh, until next time, I'm Paul Fire. We're all in this together. Thank you.